Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Michelle DiStefano. I am a visiting faculty member here at Harvard this year, helping run a few things at the Center on the Legal Profession while David Wilkins is on sabbatical. Um, it's great to have all of you here today. This, uh, this spring, we're focusing on uh, women uh, law leaders, um, and hopefully you've come to see some of our sessions. We've got a great session today with Maria Hernandez. Just a few things about Maria. Um, she's definitely a female law leader. Um, she's won um, awards for um, Best Compliance Lawyer of the Year and Best Business Lawyer under 40. Um, and uh, she has a vast experience in compliance. And one of the most unique things about Maria is that um, she never worked at a law firm until now, which is very different to start your career in-house. And in-house, she was very successful. She was at the right place at the right time, starting in compliance before compliance was as hot as it is now. She worked um, at Tyco for many years. In fact, she was appointed the ombudsman, if I could say that correctly, um, for Tyco, um, really running um, the role and all the compliance initiatives for a few years before it split. Once it split into three, one of the pieces merged with Pentair, and she ran compliance for Pentair for many years. Um, when she was with Tyco, she worked very closely with the law firm she works at now, Eversheds. And she was part of the group that devised this great partnership between Eversheds and Tyco, where Tyco gave um, pretty much all of its legal business to Eversheds. It was one of the first of its kind um, types of agreements, which we may be seeing more and more unique and creative types of agreements as times go um, forward, especially when we have such unique and creative people like Maria at law firms. Maria left um, her job at Pentair, originally to decide to start her own company in compliance consulting. Not enough um, lawyers actually able to, out there to help clients with their compliance problems. And Eversheds said, no way, we want you. <laughs> and now she's been working at Eversheds for a little bit, and she's um, here today to tell us from the inside out what it's like to work at a law firm as a, as a female lawyer in compliance and compare that to what it was like when she worked at a big corporation in the compliance world. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, hi. You probably said everything. I cannot leave the room, but uh, thank you for that introduction. And thank you for hosting me here. It's an honor, obviously, and I appreciate you coming and listening to what I have to say. Uh, this is going to be a confession. So uh, I'm going to give you things that I never thought about before putting together this presentation, which basically allowed me to sit down and think about my past professionally speaking, and my future as well. And I hope I'm able to share some of my vision with you today. So with this said, um, first of all, I'm going to talk to you about my career so that I give you the background on what I'm going to be talking about. Michelle said pretty much all about it, but uh, let me just give you some uh, bits and pieces. So I graduated in law school in Madrid and uh, went to France to study a post degree in European Union law and economics. And then I uh, spent 17 years managing legal departments, legal and compliance departments, uh, in three companies, six different positions, and six countries. And I wanted to highlight the fact that I work in very different countries because one of the uh, basic um, characteristics in my career has always been the international aspect of it, which is something that might be more common here. It's not that useful for a female lawyer to have an international career where I come from. So this is one of the things I wanted to highlight. I also did non-governmental organization work as a lawyer during my sabbatical year. Again, something that might be more common here than where I come from. Where I come from, people will look at me as if I were crazy. You took a sabbatical year? Are you crazy? You're going to break your life, your career, everything. Well, I just decided it was time for me to do it, and I had a wonderful experience, which I will share with all of you later on. And then, as Michelle was saying, I decided to join Eversheds uh, one and a half years ago to open a new practice area on the compliance field. Compliance typically uh, is not an area of expertise or an area of practice in law firms where I come from. So this was really a vision of Eversheds to open this area and uh, they trusted me this position and I will talk to you about it as well later on today. So how did 
this all happened. I graduated in my post degree in 96 in La Sorbonne in Paris, and I only had one thought in mind. Obviously, I was a graduated lawyer and I have a post degree in law and economics, but what I really wanted to do was to travel around the world. So I had this instinct uh, to tell me, well, if you find a position, even if it's not in a law firm or even in an in-house position, but that allows you to travel around the world and meet cultures, then you should probably apply for that. And that's exactly what I did. There was a company called Northern Networks, a Canadian multinational company. They had established a leadership program on the human resources field, and they were seeking for candidates all around the world, uh, graduating in law, human resources, sociology, many different kind of skills. But the one thing that appealed to me is that basically you would take on an HR position and every six months during a period of two years, you would change to a different site of human resources and you would also move to a different location around the world. So that gave it all. I say, I have to have this position. I applied for it and was successful in the interviews in the assessment center. And I finally joined the company for the first time in the UK. I took a generalist human resources position working with bizarre people to me, engineers and uh, sales people. So I learned about from the different skills that those people had in comparison with my lawyer skills. After six months, it was time for me to move to a different position within this leadership program. And I say, well, what would I like to do? I want to go far because it was one of my main objectives to travel the world in these positions. So I say, I want to go to Buenos Aires. I want to go to Argentina. So I approach the VP HR and I say, listen, this is what I would like to do. If there is a chance for me to go around over there, please think of me. Surprisingly, it happened. They thought about me and I moved to Buenos Aires where I spent six months managing HR department uh, of the Southern Cone. That would be Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Peru. Can I put it down? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm actually thinking that's the microphone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I moved to Buenos Aires six months, and then a new opportunity came, and I say it's time for me to go back to Europe and I start really stepping into the legal profession because it's okay to travel, obviously, but I study law for a reason. I really believe that I would make a good lawyer and I wanted to be a lawyer. So I say, how could I do this from an HR position? How do I transition to a legal position? So an opportunity came up in Italy this time. Uh, Nortel, Canadian company, had a joint venture with a very conservative traditional Italian company, Olideri, you may know about this company. And at that moment in time, they wanted to acquire the shares of Olideri uh, in order to make it a 100% Canadian telecom company. So I guess at the time when they were making a selection on how to change an organization, especially from a culture perspective, they thought about a graduate that had been around the world with the Canadian company coming from Spain, Southern European country. And I guess I was lucky enough, I approached them, I say, I'm really interested in this position. But do you speak Italian? Not at all, but I can learn it. Why not? Great chance. So I moved over there. People didn't speak English, most of them, in that company, very traditional Italian company. And I spent one year with two hour daily Italian lessons. Most people think that if you speak Spanish, you can speak Italian. Let me tell you, that's not true <laughs> at all. And people still think so when you grow up. <laughs> but that's, it really, it was an effort for me. But it was such an insightful job because basically my duty there was to change the organizational culture from an Italian company to a North American mentality, Canadian company. Really enjoyed the experience, finally got to speak Italian on a working level, so that was good as well. But then again, I wasn't still in the legal department, so how would I do this? One day, one of the senior guys in the legal department coming from the UK was visiting us, 
And uh, I got the chance to be in an elevator with him. And I say, this is my chance. I have to speak to this person. So I introduced myself in the elevator from the basement to the fifth floor of the office. Uh, my time was very limited. So I had to sell my, my CV in a very nice manner, right? So, uh, and I say to him, listen, my name is Maria Hernandez. Just so that you know, I'm in HR, but I'm a lawyer by education. And I would really be very interested in joining the legal department. I think I can add a lot of value. I know this company very well from many different aspects. And I'm fluent in Italian, apart from Spanish and English. So if you have a position, please think about me. Surprisingly, two months later, he calls me up and say, listen, Maria, uh, thank you for letting me know. I actually have a position for you to join the legal department. Finally, the legal department. That was the dream of my life. So he said, uh, it's going to be a legal position on the employment side. Obviously, that's where HR and legal come together. Uh, and you will be based in Paris. I say, OK, Paris is fine. I did my post degree in French, so I should easily uh, pick that up. So uh, I moved to Paris, and finally, I worked in the legal department as a European, Middle East, and Africa employment council. 15 countries under my responsibility on employment-related matters. Beautiful. I, was so, I couldn't believe it. I was surrounded by lawyers. They all talked similar to me. And I was a bit different from them because I talked a lot on business term and human resources term. But that was great. I spent uh, a couple of years in that position. And one day I say, it's time for me to move on. Uh, I want to do commercial law work. So I approach the general counsel, who was sitting very near to me in Paris. I say, listen, if you have an opportunity, if it ever comes up, think about me. I, can, I think I'm a good fit for a commercial lawyer position. It happened again. The miracle worked. And they called me up to manage the legal department of the Southern European region based out of Paris. So that would be from Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Cyprus. So I took on that position. And I got it. I was a commercial lawyer in a legal department in-house, very close to the business, but within the legal department. And then after uh, a few years, 2004, I was still living in Paris. And I had so much traveling in my veins at that time that I sat down again and reflected to say, well, I've never worked as a lawyer in a law firm. I've done in-house counsel uh, for many years now. I think it would be time for me to take time off and reflect on what I want to become. And I decided to take a sabbatical year. So for one year, I went into a non-governmental organization. And uh, it was the Spanish Commission for Refugee uh, Asylum Seekers, helping asylum seekers to get permanent residence in Spain as a lawyer. And let me tell you, out of all of these positions that I had in my career, there was, this was the most difficult one because of the human experiences. Uh, you would get uh, and listen to, and you would get home, and you would just not stop thinking about these people. Very tough position. And I loved it, except that I couldn't make a living out of it because I like traveling, I like doing things. and. Unfortunately, this didn't give me enough money to persuade my career. And apart from that, I was missing the corporate environment. I needed to see the, the action. I wanted the adrenaline of the multinationals. So one day, sitting down, having a coffee, when it is when most things happen, I think, when you're having coffee, sitting down, I was reading the newspaper and saw a position. It had my name on it. Taiko International, head of legal, for Southern Europe and Middle East. Middle East? This is new to me. OK, I'm going to apply for it. Applied for it, got the position. So I joined Taiko International, wonderful company to work for. Actually, all of them. I've been lucky enough to be working for wonderful companies and colleagues. And I headed the legal department and compliance department for several years. After a while, they called me from the headquarters in Princeton to say, listen, we have 
a position as ombudsman. This is a unique position. It would be the first one that a non-US person takes on this position. This is a crucial position for the company. The company at the time was negotiating with the DOJ and the SEC. And we would be delighted to have you on board and be relocated to Princeton with your family to be the ambassador of the compliance efforts at Tyco International. I couldn't believe it. So I called, talked to my husband. Obviously, he had to join me, so he needed to be convinced. <laughs> and uh, we decided to move on. And we relocated to Princeton to take on the position as ombudsman. This was a very different position in many senses. I was reporting to the audit committee of the board of director of the main company in the States. Very high senior position. I would join the audit committee in the board meetings every quarter, and I would present to them the trends on compliance. So apart from that, I traveled the world again, but this time also going to Asia, South Africa, everywhere, and uh, explaining people what Tyco expected from its employees and providers and third parties, and what our efforts were on the compliance-related front. So as Michelle was saying, Tyco is split it into uh, three publicly traded companies, and one of those pieces merged with a company called Pentair. So I had to take a decision at that time on whether I would stay in the US or whether I would want to go back to where I came from, which was the option. So I decided to go back to Europe also for personal reasons. I felt my daughter needed to have a little bit of grandparent uh, emotion in their lives. So uh, I moved to Europe to head the compliance department of Pentair and also to uh, head the legal department of Pentair for Southern Europe. So again, I had myself with two hats, legal and compliance. The only difference is that at that time, what I really wanted to do was compliance. But I still had the legal pressure on me, and obviously most of my time was dedicated to legal. So I call this a time when I was searching for a balance. I had the two positions. At the same time, universities in Spain, they started contacting me to become a, an associate professor, and I started collaborating with them. So it came a point where I decided that what I wanted to do is just compliance, and I would incorporate my own consultancy firm on compliance in Spain. So I notified uh, the company, and I called Eversheds, because as uh, Michelle was saying, I had worked with Eversheds for, from 2007, we reached a unique agreement, which is subject of a study actually at universities, and uh, I've known the, com the firm very, very well. So I called them up to say in Spain, listen guys, I'm leaving Pentair and I'm gonna incorporate my own consultancy firm on compliance. I know you don't have compliance, so if you ever need assistance, I'm here, these are my contact details. After a couple of weeks, they call me up and say, listen, we have a major uh, project on compliance. Would you actually like to join us instead of incorporating your own firm? And I say, well, that's a good idea. I would have a little bit of comfort instead of being by myself in the world. And I decided to join them. I knew all of the partners. I knew the law firm operating model very well. So I thought it was the perfect fit. So that's when I did the career swift. A lot of people ask me, so what made you go back to the law firm? I say, I had never been in a law firm before. So I'll tell you the reasons why I thought it was a good time for me to move into the law firm uh, environment. At the same time, I, together with uh, some friends, we decided to uh, create the Association of Compliance Professionals in Spain, of which I am a founding and a board member at the moment. And I started to write a lot of art articles on compliance-related matters and speaking at different events. So finally, I was being dedicated to compliance, which at that moment in time was what I really wanted to do. So this is just a grasp of my career so that you see how I um, 
reach the conclusions that I will give you now. What I really wanted to share with you was what I think would be the successful skills of an in-house counsel and those of a law firm partner. Just in case, for some reason, it adds some clarity to your own thoughts about what to do. So, in-house. Many people, when you graduate from law, you think when you compare work at a law firm or work at an in-house as a corporate counsel, well, probably you think it's an easier life to be in a corporate environment. I see some norms. I'm glad to <laughs> that's changed. Yeah. You've experienced that? Okay, so I'm the same view. So is in-house an easy life? Well, not really. For different reasons. I had to summarize the two main reasons I think life as an in-house counsel is not really as easy as many people think it is. First of all, you risk of being immersed into a whole bunch of different legal issues. And this is what you risk ending up like. I was the one pulling the trolley with all of these stones. People were telling me how to do better standardized procedures that would help me with all of this workload, but I wouldn't listen because I was too busy actually doing the job. So the first obsta obstacle you probably find yourselves in is your own efficiency model. And I was lucky enough to walk away from that because of very good managers and very good companies I work for. But still nowadays, I find myself doing this, which is something I need to work on. But then there is another obstacle. It's not only your own self trying to do everything. It's also how the rest of the people look at the legal department in many instances. What are you for them? You are cost. SNA. You're a cost for the company or you are non-core. The sales guys are the important people in this company. You are a necessary evil. So, okay, we, we know we need to have the lawyers around, but don't put a lot of obstacles. I mean, this is the bad picture of a company. Obviously, there are companies that where you don't see this. And, uh, but I'm just giving you some negatives on the function of, a in, uh, of an in-house counsel. So with this said, what do I think are successful skills of an in-house counsel? First of all, business acumen. And this is one of the basic differences from a law firm and an in-house counsel. You come to law from the business environment. You are going to be working with the business people. So you need to understand and talk in business terms. Give, forget all of your technical legal expertise and I start talking like the Financial Times. Read those type of papers because that's how they are going to understand you. Feel comfortable with financial terms, something sometimes lawyers we don't pay a lot of attention to. You need to read the financial statements of the corporation. You will be talking to your colleagues and they will be using these terms. So you need to get used to it as well. And very important, no why and how your company products or services excel in the market because that's going to be the key differentiator in your company and you have to help the business reach that objective and stay in that place in the industry. Secondly, organizational awareness. People might be reluctant to have you into their decision making processes. So you need to work yourself around the organization to find the needed support. As stakeholders, you have to become a political animal in a corporation if you want to escalate the ladder. Understand the big picture. So don't only focus on one task. You need to see how it would impact the rest of the organization. Judgment, and this is what I believe in-house councils are paid for. You need to exercise the judgment. What does that mean? Oh, at least that's my opinion. You need to be a risk quantifier. When you are in a business meeting, they want to hear, okay, yeah, fine, 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 fine. I heard you, but what do we risk here? So you need to tell them, if you do this, this would be the consequences. If you don't, this would be the consequences. But we are not there to threat the business. So you need to offer alternatives in a very judgmental manner, practical approach. When you're an in-house counsel, people typically, although it may 
be different in some circumstances, they don't want to see long memorandums. Even when I was an in-house counsel, I didn't want to see long memorandums from the law firm either, because my time is limited. So imagine the time of the board of directors. You need to give practical approach in very brief terms. And I will uh, add something about that later. <coughs> Because you are going to be dealing with all type of legal matters, your organizational skills obviously need to be very strong because you're going to have to prioritize. All of this, as an in-house counsel, be ready to roll up your sleeves and work with the business on the ground. And communication skills, it's not only good that you can talk to people, you need to talk to people the way they want to hear you. So. Michelle may prefer long memorandums, for example, which I don't think is the case, <laughs> but <laughs> I may prefer short-term memorandums, but I found both type of people in the business. Some board members want long memorandums and want to understand their every detail on how you reach certain conclusion. Other people don't. So you need to adapt your communication skills to different typology of people. But the most important thing you need to keep in mind, you need to be part of the team. So what you need to do is to earn your place at the business table. And that would be your ultimate objective. Once you get that, I think you can consider yourself as a successful in-house counsel and they would respect you for that. So what about private practice then? Why would a person that considers herself a successful in-house counsel decide to move to private? I gave some of the reasons before, but there were objective reasons and subjective reasons in my decision. Objective reasons, I wanted to focus on compliance, which didn't seem to be possible in Spain without having as well the legal hat on. Very important, multi-sectorial perspective. When you are in-house, you know a lot about the industry in which your company operates, but you know nothing about other industries. I wanted to have experience in pharmaceutical industry, in financial institutions, manufacturing. Law firms will give you that because your clients will be very diverse. You don't get that working in just one company. It was the right time from a practical common sense perspective. Legislative changes in the Spanish market, European market on compliance. Nowadays, uh, there is a big imposition on compliance programs for corporations. And also the resources in the market were very scarce. People hadn't had any experience on compliance in the market I wanted to operate. So it seemed like a good decision to be working there and I had already established a reputation on the compliance front, mainly because of the conferences I was participating in, also because I was a professor at the time on corporate compliance in LLMs in Spain. So from an objective perspective, that seemed like a right decision. But I have to admit there were also subjective uh, reasons, which are not always a true reflection of reality, now that I think about it. When I first joined Evershed's, one of my partners in the UK told me, welcome to the real side of law. And I have to admit that I had that inside my mind. Maybe when we are educated as lawyers, we think we need to be part of a law firm because that's where lawyers really outperform. So I kind of had that also uh, underneath um, in my mind, independency. As an in-house counsel, and I was lucky enough because the companies I work for, the legal department could really take decisions and it was independent, but not as independent as you are in a law firm, clearly, because there you are the business and you take your decisions independently. Also, it, had, it was good to, to hear that I would be surrounded by legal colleagues in different fields of law, which was not the case when I was an in-house counsel. And very important to me, because I know the firm very well and I've known them for years, the fact that it was Evershed's and the colleagues that I already knew and I felt very much identified with their model. 
So what was the first thing that happened when I joined the law firm? When I was general counsel or chief compliance officer, I was invited to every single event that was going on. And I thought it was because I was very good. I joined as a law firm partner and suddenly I had to pay to be at every event. So I thought to myself, I'm no longer popular. Well, that's not really the case. At least you were invited. It's just there was a little phrase at the end of the invitation. Payment will be blah, 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 blah. So I had to pay to do things, which is fine. I mean, you would get budget for that typically. What do I think nowadays that are the successful skills of a law firm partner in comparison with an in-house counsel? Clearly, the expertise in the subject matter. In my case, I was opening the compliance practice of the firm. So, and I could prove that I had the expertise that a lot of people in the market didn't have or don't have yet. This is a prerequisite, not only for a partner, but also clearly for a private attorney in a law firm. Very strong analytical skills so that you can give that advice to your clients. And you need to be very well kept up to date. You are going to be the one typically informing your clients of the changes in legislation. Secondly, manage the team, your team, and the egos. Because law firm partners, our egos are enormous. And you're going to be with other partners. So you're going to have to deal with all of that. It's like almost a political sense in a corporation, but in a partnership. Uh, so, and that's not always an easy thing to do, I have to say. And I didn't realize this was the case when I was in-house. You just see those dynamics when you go into the law firm. Obviously, attention to detail, but very much to the lawyers that are working with you in the practice area supervision. Now, the big difference, commercially oriented, big difference in terms of now you're going to be asking for money for your knowledge. How the heck do you do this? Because I didn't know. So now you are the core business, no longer cost for the company. You are the business. You need to translate the advice you provide into money. How do you price your advice? It was very difficult for me, it still is in many occasions, because I'm used to collaborate with a company and to provide advice for free. So nowadays I need to put price into my advice. Big difference with the corporate uh, environment. Think about long-term client loyalty and not only immediate results. And I think sometimes law firms may lack this. They uh, lose uh, the long-term investment on a client. So all of this, together with managing fees and most importantly, getting the client satisfaction. The one thing I have to be grateful to the in-house position is that in comparison, I believe very humbly with other uh, firm partners, I have the big picture in my mind. So where I'm, when I am advising a client on a compliance related matter, I'm very easily identifying other legal needs that the company may have. I always have my corporate environment in my brain after 17, 18 years, obviously, as an in-house counsel. And I think this is something law firms could really, really, really benefit from bringing people from the business into the law firm environment. Don't lose the big picture. This is really the one thing I think makes a difference in my case. And how do you do all of this? If there was one thing I had to tell you about, would be this. No matter what you do, ethics and integrity in everything you do, you are building your reputation. In every step, you need to keep this in mind. Because obviously, and me being dedicated to compliance, I'm very used to speak about ethics and integrity. But I firmly believe in this. Keep honest to yourself and make every step you believe, always having in mind that is your reputation, what is at stake. With this said, yeah, if you have any questions. Yes. I have like two questions that are 
more kind of student, student oriented, like law student oriented. And one is, um, as a JD student who would be interested in working in Spain, what are the what are the opportunities that are there for JD trained lawyers? I know like arbitration and antitrust are some of the areas that people take JDs, but it seems to be difficult to break into that market. And once you're there, how do you switch to an in-house role in Spain? And a, a second aside question, looking at your biography and seeing that you were a professor at the Instituto de Presa, that's somewhere that I'm interested in going in my 3L year. What kind of, what do you think that that environment offers, especially being in a LLM environment, a lot of Spanish speaking LLMs, what does that offer that you think would be something that would be a value add that you wouldn't necessarily be able to get out of Harvard beyond the, obviously the cultural, you know, Spain is awesome, but aside from that, like, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean from that exposure at, at Instituto de Empresa? Mm. I, we can talk later, obviously, about Instituto de Empresa and what I, I'm a professor at the, ta at the moment at Instituto de Empresa. But your first question um, In Spain, um, companies usually, when they put together a job description for a position, they ask for law firm experience most of the times. That's why I'm so bizarre because I didn't have that experience when I started in-house. So if you would want to go to Spain and make a career there, you would probably be good working for a law firm at the beginning. Uh, in what areas? That was the other question. Antitrust in Europe. Competition law obviously is huge. Data privacy is huge at the moment as well. Compliance is enormous. But there are always going to be M&A and uh, really any, any type of work. Take into consideration that Spain as a country, well, it's one of the biggest in Europe, but you also have Latin America. A lot of the headquarters of worldwide companies are based out of Spain because of the emerging markets. They serve from there. So I think anyone with an international uh, framework who has a study in a major prestigious university, as Harvard Law School, obviously, definitely has a chance to be working in Spain. And I don't know if that answers your question. No, yeah, it does. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, I have one general question and then one person uh, related to you personally. So one, uh, there's a lot of trend now to separate the compliance factor for general counsel. I'd be really interested to hear your opinion. Definitely, probably you'll promote kind of bringing a separate role and the reporting line to the CEO. But what is your view and um, what is the trend according to you? Does it make sense to separate or not? And my second question, you mentioned one of the challenges being the partner in the law firm was to kind of pitch and shift your mind being a salesperson. So can you talk about more about that and how you now develop business as a salesperson for legal services mm. when in-house you didn't have this problem? No, that's true. Actually, uh, let me start with the second one, okay? Uh, because you say as in-house you didn't have that problem. And as I was talking about it, I say, well, that's not necessarily true. Because many times as an in-house, you need to justify your position. And you need to justify that you are actually bringing value to the business. One very good way of doing that as an in-house counsel is by showing to the business the cost of failure, which we obviously have. We have settlement agreements with the DOJ, the SEC on the compliance environment, on multi-million dollar fines. That's a good thing to sell your case. Now, as a par law firm partner, you need to invest time at the beginning in being seen everywhere. The difficulty I had was that I was being seen everywhere as an in-house counsel before I joined the firm. So for the market, nothing changed because I was the same person in my same dresses going to everywhere. So I had to, to start working on uh, in Spain, I, I don't know how it is in the US, in Spain a lot of work is done through lunch, uh, actually. So you would need to start calling up people and say, would you like to have lunch? I would like to discuss several things with you. And then suddenly, and you don't realize, and you get very frustrated. Last year, which was the first year, I was like, oh my God, this is not going to work. I don't know how to sell myself or, or, or the services I can provide. But actually, you are doing it, you just don't realize. There is a time when they call you and say, listen, Maria, remember that conversation we had over lunch or we had over that conference at the break? Two months later, they call you up and say, I want to hear more about that. And I would say, would you like to come to my firm? And I'll introduce you to the rest of the partners. The other important thing when you are a law firm partner, you are not only selling your practice area, you want to sell the practice area of the whole firm. 
So even though my colleagues in the, the, the compliance officers of the world in the Spain, even though I would obviously be interested in selling compliance uh, products to them, they might also be interested in other legal functions or the general counsels. So the one thing I would recommend, I did not only meet with the person in the company that was dedicated to my own area of practice, I would try to meet with a general counsel so that I could sell the whole portfolio of our services in Spain. And that actually also helped developing my own area. Um, did I answer your question? And then there was another question. Can you repeat that for me? Yeah. General Counsel Compliance Office. Michelle would love this. He, she probably has good insight. Now, clearly, I believe in separation. But the one thing I give, uh, I, I explain to, to my LLM students, I don't necessarily think a compliance officer needs to be a law graduate. Actually, one of the best people I've met in a compliance officer position, they came from the environmental and the quality side. Audit is also a very good skill in a compliance officer. I do still believe it's good for a company to have the two roles separated because I think the functions are just very different. So, yeah. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Two things. One, I would love to hear you actually expand a bit on the, 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 the compliance versus law uh, question uh, because uh, do you feel that this is in fact a, a major division going on in how uh, uh, we regulate things. Mm -hmm. uh, and if so, what's left for law in some ways? It's not so, so much the right. right compliance, what's left for law. But also then, what is the role in compliance of uh, the, some of the new developments of project management technology, all that kind of thing? You see, you see that that mm -hmm. would be a particular spot for some of those, those approaches. Such a good point, because I'm actually finding this in the marketplace. A lot of times, also because people knew me from my, uh, some people, a lot of people, from my in-house position, they called me up just to say, listen, Maria, I have a, an offer or a proposal from a law firm. And in comparison with your proposal, they also have this software associated. Do you think that's necessary? And I, I have to tell them the truth because of this ethics and integrity I have, right? I say, listen, I don't think it's mandatory. Legally, it's not mandatory in the country I come from, at least. If I had the money, it would make my life easier. Why wouldn't I want to buy something that makes my life easier? Of course I would. Now, if you're asking me if you need to have it in order to be a good compliance officer, I don't think that's the case. So, but I definitely, if I could offer that, I would prefer to be offering it. I fully agree. I think it's innovation is always good in this area. Experience and also present experience from the law firm. Uh, here during the lectures, we hear from time to time that uh, these arrangements are changing mm. in recent years. Mm. Could you share your experience uh, from in house perspective and also as now we have to pitch? Mm -hmm. what, what tactics do you use? Yeah, this is a very interesting question. And the, um, okay, so when I was an in house counsel, I was lucky enough to be participating in a very innovative of the time legal model uh, between Everchets and Taiko International. Uh, but before that, uh, I also worked for at another a major multinational company, and I, we didn't have any creative or innovative legal fee structure. Now, my area of practice, obviously, is different to other areas. I am very much project-oriented, designing and implementing compliance program for companies, except if I am doing forensic investigations, which is also part of my compliance role. Now, I don't think nowadays you can approach a pitch just saying, my hourly rate is this. You're going to have to be creative on how you manage fees or additional things you are going to be offering to the company. Maybe uh, secondments instead of uh, billing different options. From my perspective nowadays, I very rarely uh, invoice on hourly fees. I do project management and in case of litigation, for example, you could also have a success fee and that's usually something appealing to the corporations. But uh, there is also work, uh, and I'm talking as an in-house counsel, that is routinary, like templates, contracts, 
uh, different type of arrangements. I think you cannot invoice a company the same for that type of work than you would invoice for a major project. So definitely, it needs to be uh, a creative. And the most important thing, I think what you need to do is to work out with the company you're offering the pitch, what makes most sense to them. I don't know if I answered that. You're welcome. or if the market has changed because of the downturn in terms of that, it clearly gave you so much, so many interesting insights and experiences, mm. but if you sort of how you would recommend. That's difficult to say because it depends as well on where, which market you're operating. At, at the time when I did it in Spain, they thought I was crazy. They thought my career was over, basically. So I think it, it, if I had to respond to your question, it would be a, a very own thought. Like, it, it's your own instinct telling you what you need to do in a certain way. For me, it was a matter of wanting to stop for a while and do something different. What I didn't realize was that I would also have this human approach to law, which brought so many things for the future. The things that came after that, they were very much related. It helped me to interact with different type of people. So would I take a sabbatical? It depends on where you are in your career. I mean, if you are very happy and you have uh, ambition or not, you might go into a, a corporation and they stay there 50 years and be completely happy. And that's fine as well. It doesn't seem to be my pattern, to be honest with you, <laughs> but why not? So if that's the case, why would you take a sabbatical? You're happy where you are. That's fine. In my case, it was a matter of breaking to think what I wanted to do next. So I'm afraid I cannot answer why way or another, but just give my own perspective into it. Yes. Hi, Maria. Um, I'm actually from Spain, so I'm an LLM student. All right. And I have like um, the opposite experience. So when I finished law school, I went to a regional law firm. Mm -hmm. And I felt like very curious about your comment on uh, life in as in health being as tough as life in a uh, <laughs> big law firm because most of um, yeah. my colleagues in the law firm and myself thought that our lives, you know, could not be more tougher, so... Uh, <laughs> right. So, could you could elaborate on, like, what do you mean exactly? Right. Uh, so what I mean by that, at least in my experience, it may also clearly differ in case you have a, a, a very stable position. my case, I joined departments that were either being created or transforming. So suddenly, you find yourself in a place where they were dumping things at you without any respect almost, and you had to prioritize and juggle with different tasks. So in that sense, I, I thought it was very difficult also because in a law firm, you're the business. You don't need to justify yourself. In a corporate environment, many times, you need to justify your work because they see you as a spend. They don't think you're valuable. So you need to demonstrate all the time until you get a certain degree of respect for your profession that what you're doing brings value to the company. Now, in that sense, I think in-house is, is tough. Now, hours, law firms, long hours. I work as long in law firm as I did. I mean, I mean it was the same. I didn't work less in a, in a corporation than I work at the law firm. But again, it depends on the position you have, clearly. But I think the most difficult part is the part of justifying why you exist in the corporation. And I think that's, that's the reason I say it's not an easy life. All right, well, thank you so thank much. Thank you. That was so great.